Hey, Senbei from Japan. I see lots of friendly faces. Hello, Anna Corbett. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Come on in, please. Keep your um, microphones on mute, if possible. If you want to go to the gallery view and see this global audience that is joining us, you're welcome to before we go into spotlight. It's a pleasure to see everyone here. I'm going to go ahead and put myself in spotlight to introduce myself to everyone. My name is Carrie Cardinelli. I'm the SVP of digital here at MEA, the world's first midlife wisdom school, and really delighted to be bringing Chip Conley Hello, and Dr. Eric Gordon up to the stage. Connor will be working. If everybody keeps your mic muted, that'll be fantastic. And before we get started, we want to go through a couple logistics. We love to use the chat feature around here. So go ahead and tell us where are you in the world right now on chat? It's like a geographical waterfall. We have alumni from 44 countries. Of course, the Buck Institute is known around the world. So let's just see who's here. Austria is here. I know that Japan is here. Canada he is here. All over the United States is here. Um, wow, fantastic. Wonderful to see everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Great, so I'm going to bring up Chip Conley first onto the stage. Hi, Chip. Hello, Good Carrie. to see you, Chip Conley. If you don't know Chip, he is the founder of MEA. He is a former boutique hotelier. He was the head of global hospitality at Airbnb, author of soon to be seven books. His newest book, Learning to Love Midlife, uh, is available right now for pre-sale uh, and will be mailed in January. And guess what? Chip is doing the audio version of the book right now in Toto Santos. Welcome, Chip. Yep, I'm in a recording studio or I'm in a padded cell. <laughs> I'm just telling you it's a recording studio. Actually, they have incarcerated me and I'm I'm stuck here, but at least they it's, allowed it's me. It's time to out for modern elders. That's what it is. Yes, it is. Thank you. It's great to, great to be here. And let me bring up Dr. Eric Verdon. We're so honored to have you here today. Um, Eric is the president and CEO at the Buck Institute. He is a geroscientist, researcher, and a professor. A native of Belgium, he received his doctorate of medicine from the University of Liege. Completed yeah. his additional, yeah, okay. <laughs> Completed his additional clinical research training at Harvard Medical School. He's also a professor of medicine at UCSF. He has published more. Get ready for this, guys. Two hundred and eighty scientific papers hold eighteen plus patents, as in, and is in the top one percent of the most highly cited scientists in the world. The Buck Institute, to me, is the NASA of aging research, looking 20 years down the road. And their ultimate goal is to extend the average human lifespan to about 100 years while limiting chronic illnesses to about the last five years of life so that everyone can experience a centenarian. Wow. So I'm really delighted to turn it over to you, Chip, and uh, looking forward to this conversation. As we go, everybody, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions. You can put them in the chat as we go. And the last half, uh, Chip may invite some of you up to the stage. So be ready for that uh, in a little while. All right, I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you so much. Mm, Eric, thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Eric, thank you so much for being here. And Carrie, uh, as always, I, I love you. And you, you are the ultimate ambassador for MEA. So thank you. Um, Eric. How long have you been at Buck and what brought you there uh, initially? Good morning, Chip. And uh, let me also just uh, wish a good morning to or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And thank you for being here. I really look forward to, to the next 45 minutes. So uh, what brought me to the Buck? I, uh, as as um, Carrie mentioned, I'm originally from Belgium. I, I've done most of my career doing academic research across the country, actually sometime on the East Coast and about 25 years now on the West Coast. I was at uh, Gladstone Institute at UCSF for, for uh, almost 20 years when in, in 2016, I was approached by the board of the Buck Institute uh, asking me whether I would be uh, considering taking the leadership. And uh, I really viewed it as a truly unique opportunity at the time. And it took me about a week to decide. And uh, and it's now been seven years since I've been here, and it's been an incredible adventure. So, so tell us a little bit. It, it's interesting. Uh, there are a lot of people in the MEA community who live in the Bay Area. 
And they may not even know that the Buck Institute exists because it's sort of a little bit private up there on a hill and it's, um, and, and you are as an institute, you know, very focused on the academic research side of things. What is it that distinguishes Buck when it comes to healthy aging and longevity? What it, what, what is the real mission of Buck? Yeah, that, that's, we are uh, unfortunately a well-kept secret, but uh, hopefully these types of event is, uh, will help to correct this. And I think, you know, in the last six years, we've, we've had a, a, a very significant effort at communicating our mission and what we're doing. But so for those of you who haven't heard, who do not know who we are, we are uh, located in Novato, about uh, 20, 12, 25 minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge on 101. If you're driving out of Novato, you will see up on the hill, it's a beautiful uh, IMP building, um, uh, one of his last building that he designed. Um, <clears throat> we are, we, are the largest institute in the world that's focused uniquely on the biology of aging. And we were founded uh, 20, 21 years ago uh, based on a, on a few observations that um, suggested that aging was a, a biological process that was actually track, tractable therapeutically. And so there were a number of papers published in uh, uh, during the 90s that suggested that you could actually modify the rate at which animals aged. And when I was hired at, at the Buck in 2016, uh, what the, mission, the vision that I sold to the board was the idea that after doing about 15 years of basic research, understanding aging in, in simple model systems, such as the, the mice or fruit flies or a little worm that we call C. elegans, it was now the time to try to bring all of these discoveries into humans. And so this is really uh, what occupies a lot of my effort right now is to transform the back from a basic research institute studying aging to a, a biomedical research institute that hopefully will change uh, the way we think about aging and actually alter uh, the course of aging. Uh, so a few more words also in terms of who we are. Right now we have about 300 employees um, uh, divided in about uh, 22 different groups. Uh, so we operate as a not-for-profit research institute. Uh, our faculty members, we have about 20 of them, each direct small, small groups that are focused on different aspects of aging. And uh, we are mostly funded by the government, from by the NIH, uh, but also, which is in some way we take as a, uh, with a badge of, of pride because it is uh, peer reviewed uh, and is considered sort of a, a solid science. Uh, so this is not a fringe place. This is really a biomedical research institute in the best tradition of, of many that have been founded in the US. Uh, but really what, what defines us is our unique focus. Many traditional departments, when you go to a university, are focused on diversity. They want to hire faculty who are working on different topics. We, we're doing exactly the opposite. Uh, we're all interested in aging, but we take it from different perspectives. Uh, some people take it from the perspective of Alzheimer's disease. Some take it from the perspective of mitochondrial function and so on. Uh, it's been uh, it's an incredible place to work. And I, I hope that this uh, message, uh, this 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 conference will discussion will stand as an invitation to all of you who are local, who are interested in visiting. We just uh, restarted our our um, our visits for uh, outside, outsiders, and so you're welcome to contact us and and come and and see for yourself. Beautiful. Well, let's let's <laughs> take let's take this to the personal side for a moment. Not so much personal to you, although you're welcome to talk about this, Eric. Um, but what if you had to come up with three to five the, of your best pieces of advice to someone in midlife who wants to live longer, what would you recommend to them from a lifestyle perspective? Well, the, the first, first is a piece of data that I want to share with you. Uh, it turns out that about 93% of your longevity and when I say longevity, it doesn't mean not, not only how long you're going to live, but how healthy are you going to live. So we have two variables we call lifespan. That's the total number of years that you're living, but also your health span, which is how many years are you going to live healthy? Turns out for many of us in, in the U.S. and in the Western world, we, we spend a significant portion of our lives uh, actually with disease, about 15%. So 93% of this 
is determined by lifestyle factors. Only about 7% is determined by genetic factors. So you- oh, that, unfortunately- that, That's interesting. I mean, because it, I, it, I think what I used to hear was this maybe 80-20 or what, it, has, has it been known for a long time it's 93% or yeah. is, that, is that new information? It's new information. The old number was 20 to 80%, yeah. 20 versus 80. Uh, the latest study that I've seen published, which I think is the most convincing, is based on uh, millions of samples uh, in, in the Ancestry.com uh, database, uh, really suggests that it's mostly non-genetics. Now, this is true only if you do not have a centenarian in your family. So if your your grandfather or your father or your mother or your brother is a centenarian, then it becomes very strongly genetic. Uh, mm. But that's a very small sliver of the population. For most yeah. of us, the message should be that it's on us. And I think I find this uh, incredibly empowering uh, message because it means that whatever actions you take throughout your life, uh, your lives will determine the type of uh, old age you will have and will determine how old you can expect. Now, when we think about lifestyle, um, it encompasses essentially everything that you are exposed to in your life. And that goes from where you live, uh, you know, the air you breathe, the food you eat, uh, whether you're exercising and so on. But so the field has been able to determine uh, what what I call sort of buckets or uh, areas that are really critically determinant. And uh, I'm not going to surprise anybody by telling you what they are, but the, the, the importance comes into the granularity, what's in these buckets. So the buckets are nutrition. Uh, that's the first one. Second one is physical activity. I don't like the term exercise because it's truly physical activity. The third one is sleep and stress mitigation. Um, the fourth one is human connections, uh, which is, by the way, the most important one, uh, as we will uh, we will discuss in a few minutes. And the last one is uh, drugs and supplements, and which is the one that I, you know, everyone comes to me or to us at the back asking, you know, what's the latest drugs that I should be taking? And my answer is always, these drugs and these supplements will be part of of the interventions that you will do to help uh, mitigate the effects of aging or to age better. But the foundation is the first four. And what's perhaps most, so you you were asking me all the facts that that are important, is each of these buckets actually are complementary to each other. That it means if you're filling your your nutrition bucket, it's not sufficient. If you exercise on top of it, you get more effect. Uh, If you have great social connections and a sense of purpose in life, you get even more of an effect. If you sleep well, you have more of an effect. And today, for all of you, who are sitting and listening, if you optimize everything, there's 20 years of extra healthy life uh, to be grown. 20? 20. Wow. And I would say 15 to 20, okay, Okay. depending on on some other factors. But for most of us, 15 to 20 years. And the prediction that that I make, and this is based on number, this is not a wishful thinking, is that most of us, if we were to optimize all of our lifespan in effect, could expect to live between 90 and 95 in good health. Yep. And that to me is already incredibly transformative. Yes. Uh, by the way, I see Anne Wheat on the call. Anne, hi, we used to own Millennium Restaurant together and she has been a vegan for a very long time. And I, <laughs> that, that woman's going to live a long time. She lives in, in Marin. So what is it? Uh, what's up with the United States though, Eric? I mean, like, why are we in suffering so badly relative to other the rest of the developing world or developed world? Um, you know, and and is there an easy solution here? Uh, yes, um, really good point. And I think you know your audience might not be fully aware of this, but we are lagging. Uh, average life expectancy in the U.S. right now is 76. It's gone down from 78 in the last two or three years, you know, in large part during the pandemic. Uh, most of the Western world is at 80, 82. Uh, Japan is even a little further, 83, 84. Um, so the factors that are the cause of this are threefold. One, um, 
COVID, the pandemic, uh, the response, the lack of vaccination, the, the you know the doubts with regards to vaccination and so on. That was clearly what uh, caused the recent dip. But before the dip, we were already lagging. And the two major uh, factors were uh, one, the opioid epidemic is killing at a high rate right now. And this is increasing. The numbers actually look absolutely horrible. And this is further accelerated by the, the appearance of fentanyl right now. Uh, and the, the deaths are, are just, you know, there are three to four times more people dying from opioid overdose uh, this year than from car accidents. Uh, and, it's, it's, and, and with no end in sight. So it's actually a, a, tra- a true tragedy. But the, the big silent killer that actually is responsible for where the US is right now is the obesity epidemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are leading the way. Uh, it's not a good news or bad news, but the rest of the world is following. So the US is about 10 to 15 years ahead of the rest of the world in terms of the scale of the obesity epidemic. Um, Today, more than half of the population in the US is is close, is considered overweight or obese. Uh, And so, and we know obesity itself is, becomes a risk factor for accelerated aging. And so I think uh, these are, you know, the three major issues. The one that's, I think is the most significant in the long term in terms of its scale is clearly the obesity epidemic. And, you know, even though the rest of the world looks at, you know, uh, at, at the U.S. as an as an aberration, when you look at the curves, they are really falling uh, close behind. Mm. And, and it doesn't seem like there's an easy solution on this. No, but there are clearly solutions. And uh, and uh, the sad thing also is this uh, obesity epidemic is not affecting everyone in, in the same way it becomes another uh, layer of, of what people call the social determinants of health. It turns out that your biggest predictor of your life, life expectancy is actually your zip code. <clears throat> and that's a reflection of not only wealth, but also you know access to uh, fresh food, uh, s- stress in your daily life, clean air, and so on. So what we're seeing in the US in terms of life expectancy, for example, is the two coasts and the Midwest are showing a, a significantly higher life expectancy, health span and lifespan. And the Southeast is actually uh, really showing really significant problems in terms of life expectancy. But we also see what's interesting is so we see this not only sort of ge- geographically on a large scale, but we see this also within cities. Uh, there's been a number of classical studies on you know, done in, in Glasgow or in, in, Ch- in Cleveland or in Chicago that show neighborhood by neighborhood, you have Delta in life expectancy that can be as large as 15 to 20 years. And I, I would say as a society, I think we really have to, uh, <clears throat> you know, the tendency for the scientists is to say, well, you know, this is not our problem. This is a political problem Let the politicians fix it. And the politicians say, well, this is social engineering and we don't do this. So, uh, everyone is sort of looking at each other. I'm convinced that there's a middle ground where scientists can actually educate the politicians in terms of identifying what are the major variables and what we call the social determinants of health that actually will lead to an increase in, in life expectancy for everyone. What about, is there any promise in these new rampant? Are, what do you think about is it Ozempic? Um, do yes. You, is that is that is there a thumbs up on that, or do you have some caution about it? Globally, thumbs up. Although you know the idea of medicating half of the American population uh, seems a bit disturbing, not only in terms of cost but also in terms of concept. Um, Ozempic, so is is a is a first in class of a group of drugs called GLP one agonists. So these are drugs that are interfering with, you know, with insulin signaling and, and really uh, induce a profound weight loss uh, in people, 15 to 20%. So they are, uh, uh, they will be important. And it's been shown that they don't only induce uh, a weight loss, but also they reduce your risk of heart disease, reduce your risk of cancer. Now there's evidence uh, that they might be reducing your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And we know all of these variables are tied up together. That this is what we call the aging pathways, a subset 
of, of, uh, of molecular pathways that are controlling not only how you age, uh, how, how old you will live, but also how well you will age. So this is all linked. And, and I would predict that Ozempic and, and, and the drugs in this class will, will end up being the first anti-aging drug that we, we have that will be deployed on, on the mass uh, 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 in, in the whole population. Now, the problem, there are multiple problems with this. Uh, one, cost. And, and philosophically, there's something that really bothers me by the idea that we would all be relying on this. I think education in some way is really critical. And, and frankly, I think the food industry uh, has played an, an equivalent, a role that I would, I would call equivalent to tobacco uh, mm -hmm. in, in this country uh, by essentially uh, really sort of uh, disturb, uh, creating a dystopian vision of what food is actually. And uh, I, I predict that um, this dystopian view of food and, and nutrition is going to be corrected the way we correct it uh, the tobacco problem, uh, we will address this. And, and we can see a lot of signs that the food industry itself is realizing. This started with the beverage industry, frankly, uh, the high sugar drinks. There's a lot of pressure for those uh, or, or companies to reorganize and change. But the, the same thing will be uh, for all other companies. And so there, there's a, there, there will be a movement uh, in this direction. There was a movie a few years ago, uh, Morgan Spurlock, uh, Super Size Me. Um, I'm curious if there's a documentary film like Food, Inc. or something like that, that you think really captures this issue around uh, the food industry. Uh, I, I cannot speak of a specific movie. I would, uh, I would call the attention of your audience to Michael Pollan's books. Uh, uh, this is really, if you want to read a, one small book, it's called, you know, What You Eat or How, how to Eat. Uh, it's a small 100-page book that really describes the principles of what uh, alimentation is and uh, a healthy, a healthy uh, diet should be. And I, I think, you know, I read this book every three months myself just to remind myself wow. because it's it's so easy to read. And, uh, and there's, you know, I... I I hate to be sort of the uh, the, the the voice of, of bad conscience in people's head. I go to dinner with people and and they're you know they don't know if they should be eating this. They ask me and and I'm always you know there's there's two aspects to food. One it's it's an incredible social lubricant. Our societies are organized around food. We take so much pleasure in cooking and sharing, uh, and that should never be disturbed. That being said, there are a lot of choices that you can make that uh, have a big impact in the long run. And, and when I think about uh, food or, or about nutrition or about, uh, about exercise and all this, I, I really don't believe in absolutist uh, type of uh, theories, you know, excluding all of this or all of this. Um, I really believe in, in sort of your nutrition bucket is, 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 a, is an investment bank account that you can fill. Every time you choose to eat something healthy, you are compounding interest into, into this account. It doesn't mean that when you're eating, you know, something that's a little less healthy one time, it's going to hurt you. Just think about it as every day to try to do something that, that is actually will, uh, will lead to uh, better health. And, and the same goes for sleep, the same goes for every one of these. Um, you know, no one wants to leave uh, a monastic life, at least I don't. Uh, I want to enjoy friends, family, uh, uh, partying, uh, uh, sometimes a little bit of excess, uh, and uh, but at the same time, really being highly conscious of the decision that I make because these decisions have a profound impact of how how you're going to age. So we had Bob Waldinger um, on the um, fireside chat uh, from Harvard a couple months ago, and Dan Butner was teaching at our MEA campus in Baja earlier this year. Um, any thoughts about their their work, the the Harvard um, study of adult development, which of course focused on uh, his book earlier this year, focused on the the social side of you know the value of social uh, relations or social wellness, and of course blue zones focusing on longevity. Any any thoughts on either of those? Yeah, two 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 thoughts. Uh, first, you know when studies have been conducted looking at the relative impact of, of all these buckets, the lifestyle factors, 
and how they influence your aging. Um, you can actually, based on data, you can rank order them and you can say, okay, what's the most important? It turns out that um, social connection is tops. And that really reflects the fact that we are a social animal. We just live in society. We love each other's company most of the time. Um, and, um, and it is the biggest predictor of your life expectancy. So the largest number of deep connections you have with other humans. And this can be a spouse, this can be a partner, this can be a child, this can be a friend. It doesn't really matter whether none of these categories have any particular value. It just, it needs to be a deep relationship with a human. The larger number of those you have, the longer you will live. And my argument is always, if your diet or if your lifestyle is interfering with this variable, uh, you should reconsider what your lifestyle, uh, you know, that lifestyle factor is, is doing to you. For example, example, a strictly exclusive, ex exclusive diet tends to isolate you. Nobody wants to invite you. You can't go to dinner anywhere. So it's there's always a, a, a catch-22. Uh, the second uh, variable that was actually determined to be the most important after social connection was um, a sense of purpose which is uh, something that you know many of us go through life with really without much interest, introspection in terms of why are we here? What am I doing here? Whose service am I uh, to? Uh, and so having a sense of purpose is again, something that I invite uh, all of you, uh, all of you, this audience to really think about what, 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 what do I want to spend my life to, uh, to and uh, especially the rest of my life, uh, what is the meaning of it? Having a well-defined sense of purpose is really critically important. Um, so those are the ones that, so that, that's the first question. The second question was regarding the blue zones. Uh, so the blue zones, I have a, a bit of a mixed feeling about them uh, for, as a scientist, uh, which is different as a, as a, as a person. Uh, first, I think there is uh, intense controversy in terms of whether the blue zone actually exists. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm not attacking Dan Butner. I've talked to him. I, I respect what he's trying to do, but there is strong, there's been a really significant doubt raised from the, the validity of the population registry that have, uh, that formed the foundation for, uh, the creation of these blue zones. That being said, uh, Dan's work is, is more significant in another respect. Even if the true blue zone do not exist, uh, there are areas or populations that show significantly increased lifespan. And, uh, and what he has studied has allowed him to define a whole series of variables, which, by the way, are all lifestyle factors um, that we talk about that are associated with a longer life. And I think uh, Dan's work uh, in trying to establish a, a model or a system by which cities can adopt these, um, these types of intervention or these types of lifestyle factors is remarkable. And that's exactly when we think about, you know, oh, nothing can be done about these problems because the politicians and the scientists are looking at each other. The approach that Dan Buettner is taking by creating these local new, new blue zones is exactly the direction in which we should all be going to. Mm, beautiful. Um, so, <laughs> And I think part of this really speaks to my next question, which is the idea of healthcare versus sick care. So uh, our, at least I'll speak for the United States, but I think it's true of many places, is that um, our, the, the sheer volume of money that is spent on sick care, as opposed to the preventative healthcare that would allow people not to get sick as often, it all makes so much sense. And of course, partly because of what you've talked about, the the finger pointing and and the, the the frankly the lack of the government and pu public policymakers to make changes. Um, we have we haven't solved this. How in the next ten or fifteen years could the Buck Institute help us as a society to move a little bit more in the direction of healthcare as opposed to sick care? Let me first sort of add a little bit of color to what, what you said in terms of healthcare and sick care. Um, medicine today, which is, by the way, I'm a physician, so I, I, I'm not anti-physician. I don't never want to be sort of misunderstood in this way. 
medicine, modern medicine is what has brought us to where we are today. You know, in 1850, life expectancy was 38. Uh, today, in, in, in most of the Western world, it's close to 80. So close to the doubling of our lifespan in 150 years, uh, which means, you know, every decade we're gaining two, two extra years of life, which is by the self, itself remarkable. When you look at, you know, the arc of time, what has happened in the last 150 years is nothing short of remarkable. Um, that being said, medicine is in some ways stuck into a classical, into a model where we are treating diseases. So we are essentially, you know, we call it healthcare, but this is not what medicine is today. It's mostly sick care, focusing on, you know, you can be considering yourself healthy, 55 year old man, have an inaugural heart attack. 50% uh, of the time it will be, it will lead to death for someone who is considered healthy. The other 50% will be taken care of by the physicians um, and, and actually medicine is very good. If, if, if you survive your heart attack at really mitigating the complication and giving you the, 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 the proper medicine and treating you. The same thing for cancer. You can be 60 or 65 years old, consider yourself really healthy. And from one day to the next, you have a cancer diagnosis and you become a patient. And we will spend an enormous amount of time and money uh, to treat you using chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and so on. And we can actually cure more and more cancers. Um, another aspect of this is that we spend today close to 50% of all of our healthcare dollars in the last two years of life. Uh, at a time when, uh, frankly, I mean, not to say that you know, not every life is important, but uh, if you're 88 years old and you're slightly demented, we're still going to spend the same amount of money uh, in, in helping you survive. So 50% of all of our resources in healthcare uh, go to, um, uh, to the last two years of life. Uh, I also want to give you another number, uh, and I don't want anybody to understand this that I'm supporting Cuba, but Cuba is a, a very poor country. It spends one sixteenth, uh, one sixth, one sixteenth of our healthcare dollars, and their life expectancy is seven years longer than ours. And why is this? Because they spent all of their money on prevention, and and none of it on on the you know if you have a cancer and you're seventy five years old in in, in Cuba, good luck. Uh, you will not get treated. Uh, I'm, I'm not advocating for this. What I'm advocating is the fact that even you know one sixteenth of what we spent. Uh, really focus on preventative care uh, makes an enormous difference in terms of people's life expectancy. Now, <clears throat> another fact that I think you should, uh, that I would like you to understand is that as we study aging pathways, that is the molecular architecture in our cells that regulate the rate at which we are aging, we ended up finding out that when we tinker with these aging pathways, that we not only make animals live longer, but they seem to be living longer disease-free. And so this led to a concept that we, that the Buck Institute uh, advanced and, and, and for which we are recognized, the, the so-called geroscience hypothesis. This is the idea that right now medicine is targeting all of these diseases, Alzheimer's, cancer, uh, heart disease, heart, heart, heart attacks, stroke, type two diabetes, macular degeneration, hip fracture, we are targeting those as if they were independent occurrences. But in fact, the major risk factor for all of these diseases is aging. And since now we know how to tinker with aging itself, we can regulate the rate at which you are aging. What we see in the animal models is that when you slow down the rate of aging, the animals live longer, but they also live free of disease. And so the promise of what, what we're doing at the back and, and other places in the country and the world is really bring this to humans uh, throughout the lifespan. Uh, and because you know, we know the aging process starts around 25 to 30, and it's a process that will continue throughout life. We also know we're all aging at different rates, some of us aging fast, some slow, and eventually this leads to faster disease and faster death, or, or slower disease and slower death. So the whole idea of what the field of aging is really focused on, focused on now, right now is um, defining the best interventions, be they lifestyle or supplements or interventions that will modulate the rate of aging 
and suppress the development of all of these diseases together. And now you might say, well, this sounds like a pipe dream, but makes you think that we could actually age without being sick. Well, we know that the, the centenarians today, there's those among us who are lucky enough to live to 100, actually are much less sick than us. They typically spend about 5% of their life expectancy afflicted by disease versus us, the rest of us who are not, who not centenarian, spend about 15% of our lives afflicted by these diseases. So our vision is you know, really to be able to bring everyone to 95 in good health. Um, and I think that's a vision, frankly, that is doable today based on what we know. Now, what we're going to, we're going to do in the future, new drugs, future uh, interventions, uh, there's, there's a lot happening in the laboratory setting, but it's very hard to predict what will be doable in humans and how soon. So I, I'm going to uh, say to the audience, if you'd like to ask a question to Eric, um, free, feel free to go to the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand and we I will call on you soon. I, I, I wanna do a quick follow-up on that. Do you see aging as a disease or is it just correlated to, is it a corollary to disease? I mean, or, or it's, yeah. So you don't see aging as a disease? No. Okay. Uh, I because, think so, I, because, because there's a lot of people saying that these days. Yes, uh, I know. And I've been in the, the, the the biohackers, the biohackers sometimes. Do yes. That. And, you know, and some of my colleagues, uh, you know, David Sinclair is, is a colleague and a friend and he is, he thinks aging is a disease. I would say he's a minority in the field of what I would call the, the serious aging scientists. Uh, uh, aging is a process. It will never be completely stopped. So I, I'm clearly in the camp of the idea that you know, some people are discussing immortality or don't die or all of this nonsense. This is not what we're working on. And we clearly, you know, the Buck Institute does not participate in this type of this uh, discussion. Uh, we're not working on immortality. And frankly, I don't think it will ever happen. And we're not any closer today than we've ever been uh, to uh, living forever. It, it's just utter nonsense from a scientific point of view. Now, the discussion as to whether aging is a disease or not, I think it's is a semantic one, but I think it's an important one because uh, if you if you qualify aging as a disease, that means everybody at age twenty five is sick. Uh, I, I don't, there's something that bothers me. Um, you know, it's not a disease until it causes problem. It's a process uh, which is unavoidable, but we can which can be mitigated to some degree. So that's really how I look at it. Think about it as a risk factor. I was like, you know, is smoking a disease? No, but it certainly will make you live very short. Uh, and, you know, if you stop smoking, you will live much longer. Uh, the same thing for aging. If you can slow down the rate of aging, uh, your your lifespan will increase uh, and, and you will live healthier. But calling it a disease for me is a, is a false debate and it doesn't really add anything to the process. Got it. All right. We, I was going to ask another question, but we already have 12 people's hands up. So <laughs> you're popular, Eric. Um, this is great. Here's what we're going to do. You will have no more than two to three sentences to ask your question or say your comment. And then we'll allow uh, Eric to, to do a brief response. We'll get to as many of you as possible. Ellen, let's start with you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Eric. It's just, it's so heartwarming to hear the talk about health and health span and translating research. My question is about quality sleep, since I guess that you mentioned that, but it didn't happen. So is there data on ways to counteract hormonal insomnia due to aging? It seems to be a problem for lots of people, including myself. Beautiful. Thank you. That was a great model. Ellen did a great job of showing how it's done, asking a question. Eric. Thank you, Ellen, and great question. I, I did not have a chance to mention this, but I think sleep for me uh, is really the area that I, I consider myself a biohacker, which means that I, I like to self-experiment and to see what is working for me, you know, in addition to, because it, eventually everything will have to be personalized. So biohacking in some ways, a way of personalizing interventions. Uh, sleep for me is number one because once I am well rested and I've slept enough, uh, I have the willpower to exercise, 
to control what I'm eating and so on. If I if I have a bad night the next morning, next day I'm craving all of the things that I should not be eating. Now you mentioned uh, so sleep focusing on your sleep is really key. And uh, Matthew Walker has has a book out that I, I recommend for everyone. There's a whole idea of sleep hygiene, which is a whole series of of rules that I would urge all of you to implement, uh, especially if you have sleep uh, sleep sleeping problem. Now, the second component of your question was hormonal uh, changes associated with aging. This is particularly true in women um, where, you know, we went through an initial phase of hormone replacement therapy after menopause, uh, which was discredited based on one single study, which frankly was misinterpreted, uh, the the, the Women Health Study, which suggested that women on, on hormonal replacement therapy had an increased rate of cancer, breast cancer. Now, there's a lot of debate right now uh, ongoing, and I, I'm in the camp of, of the idea that um, the, the, the Women Health Study was largely misinterpreted, and I think it's really important for the field to go back to re-examining uh, hormonal replacement therapy for, for most women. So that would be, I hope that this, and there are, by the way, if you don't have a physician, if you have a physician who has fallen sort of victim to the, the current zeitgeist in terms of what... Um, what hormonal replacement therapy means, there are a lot of different physicians who are actually retaking another harder look at this. And I would encourage you to find one of those. Beautiful. Thank you. Amy, you were, you know, it was so good seeing you here in, in Baja just recently. Um, what's your question? Thank you. What an experience. And thank you for this call. My question is, um, I love how you just pointed out that a lot of times we find out that some of the things we thought were correct end up being incorrect and need to be revisited. So even this 93% can change. Maybe it will be even more as time goes on and research expands. Have you been studying how mindset affects the overall optimization. So if I believe that I'm not getting enough sleep or if I am, you know, how does mindset affect how we optimize that? Are you studying that as well? Uh, we are not studying this, but one of my dreams is um, is to uh, really create a psychology uh, unit at the back in the future, because I think you know, and you know, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the work of Becca, Be Becca Levy. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 a beautiful book, and I think it reflects on on the fact that um, you know we know optimists uh, live much longer than non-optimists, uh, and and I think and I really believe in the plasticity of the human brain. So even though you might be a pessimist by nature, uh, you can there's something called cognitive behavioral therapy that can actually help you in doing changing the way you think and and changing your mental scheme. So. I, I believe that um, yes, it is a huge component, and uh, and I think one that I would encourage. I'm, I'm naturally optimistic, so for me, it's it's impossible to to think of any other way. But I, I'm sometimes uh, I'm struck by the fact by the discrepancy between what we know today uh, in terms of what you should be doing for your health and the sort of fatalistic or pessimistic approach that most people take towards their own longevity. And I think understanding what are the barriers to actually implementing, you know, exercise, physical activity is, is the best biohack against aging. It's going to be 20 to 25 years until we have a better drug than excess physical activity. And, but 80% of Americans do not exercise. 80%, they don't do anything. They don't even walk 10 minutes a day. So, to me, this, there's there's an incredible gap between us, you know, living in our ivory towers, telling people it's all about lifestyle and and the reality on the ground. And the key question is that I think we have to address as a group is what are the barriers that actually prevent people from changing uh, lifestyle? And as you mentioned, mindset is really that's the hardest one. Uh, to tackle, and I think we're not paying enough attention to it. And I'm, I'm determined to have uh, a whole unit here or a department here at the back in the future that will address this. How do we change people's approach to their own health and their and, and their and their longevity? You can find. Thank you, uh, Eric. You can find a on our on the MEA YouTube channel a conversation with me and Becca Levy uh, for when her book came out, Breaking the Age Code. And as MEA alums know, 
um, MEA was really created partly because we felt like her research, which showed that you know shifting your mindset on aging had a profound impact, seven and a half years of additional life. Uh, we needed to create a, a real world laboratory for that. And that's what MEA is all about. So thank you for that question. Sembei from Japan, how are you? Fine, thank you very much for today. Yeah, uh, I hope to see uh, Dr. Verdin uh, in Japan t uh, next month. <laughs> and my question is, uh, the pandemic uh, changes our communication style and from uh, real to like this, the online. Uh, what do you think about it? Does it impact some of uh, for, uh, our aging or lifestyle, lifespan? Yeah, I, I think, uh, it, thank you, Senbei. That's an excellent question also. I, I think the pandemic has taught us um, two things uh, that come really to the top of my mind. One is um, human connection. Uh, I don't know if you had this experience, but I had it. Um, a Zoom connection with colleague does not replace being at the office and interacting with people. Even though it is human connection, it's still not of the nature, you know? So we've seen in the US, part of the, 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 the problems has been an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And, and this was compounded by the fact that many of us, you know, who used to rely on social networks at school or at work, actually now we're stuck at home behind a computer screen. So clearly, while Zoom is an incredible uh, medium for all of us to get together and, 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 and share this information today, it is not the way you know, that humans will prosper in terms of their psychology and their well-being. So that's one thing. And I think, uh, so, you know, we see increasing isolation in the U.S. and I suspect in some other cultures as well, which I think is something that we will have to deal with as a society. Uh, the other thing that we've learned from the pandemic is, is the fact that, you know, the biggest risk factor from dying from COVID uh, is actually your age. Uh, you know, everyone gets infected at the same rate, but we see if you are above 80 years old, your risk of dying from COVID is 350 fold higher than if you're 18 years old. And so this really brought to the front the fact that COVID, and now it turns out the same, same applies to influenza, the flu, or RSV and other viruses. For each of these viruses, there's a very steep increase in mortality associated with age. And this is one area that we are investigating very closely. What is it about the uh, human immune system that degrades as we age? And for example, that prevents you from mounting an immune response after vaccination. And how can we ameliorate? This is a whole new area of investigation that's been spawned by the, by the pandemic, uh, which again, another one of the problems we will have to solve if we wanna live um, uh, more healthy in the future. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, thank, thank you. you. Sembe, it's great to see you. Debbie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes Debbie, how are you? Thank you. Uh, I'm great. Uh, I, I just want to know if there's a way for those of us that do practice healthy aging um, to determine the biological age. I know a lot of people talk about what your chronological age is, but it, is there, how is that, how can that be determined? I've heard other people do it. Yes. Um, so what you are referring to is a whole field in our field called the biomarkers of aging. You know, everyone recognizes that if we are going to be, if we have an intervention, for example, physical activity or, or a diet or a medicine, metformin or rapamycin that we think might be slowing down the aging process, how do we actually prove this? Uh, and a lot of the studies that led to these association between lifespan and, and exercise and all this are linked, are, are epidemiological studies looking at you know, a whole period of time and looking to see the people who exercise tend to be living longer. Now, we are in a position and we will be uh, even more and more that we will have novel interventions. I think there's some background voice now, maybe. Uh, novel interventions and novel drugs that actually um, suppress the aging process. And of course, no one is anticipating that we're gonna be doing a 30 year study so therefore, it's going to be important to have surrogate markers, things that you can actually measure in blood 
that will indicate how well you are aging. And so this is what people are referring to as the clocks. Uh, you've heard of Steve Horvath clock. Uh, there, there's a proliferation of these clocks. Um, uh, and these clocks allow you to measure what's called the biological age. And we all have two different ages. You have your chronological age, which is how old you are, and your biological age, how old, how many years you've lived. And you know, a colleague uh, said you know, the way you measure this is using a calendar, so you don't need any fancy test. But there's, we also have a biological age, which is uh, even though you know I'm 66 years old, is my body similar to that of a regular 66, or do I look younger? And and so in in my case, I've done. I've applied you know, many of these clocks and the disconcerting finding, so I've, I've tested these clocks that exist today, is they give me a biological age between 24 and 66. <laughs> they're, all, they're all over the place. And so I, I think you know, my, my recommendation to all of you who are using these clocks is that, in my opinion, they're not ready for prime time. Of course, everybody likes the clock that tells you that you look and sound younger, and uh, and I like the clocks that do this for me. And uh, but not very not ready for prime time. That's my opinion. Now the clocks can have a little more value and and be more ready for prime time if you use a single clock and you follow it over time and you change, for example, the lifestyle factor and you see your clock actually going down instead of going up. And in this respect, I think some of the clocks, especially, I would I would argue if you're going to use these tools uh, today, I would I would I would test several, three or four, and and try to get a, a, a better picture, understanding that we don't really understand what the clocks measure. They do measure something related to the biology of aging, that's for sure, and that the the true val their true value today is their variation up or down depending on different lifestyle factors. Very good, thank you. I'm going to go to Elaine Hendricks. Um, Elaine, uh, do you, do you mind turning on your your video? I have the flu right now, ironically, oh, so I'd really okay. rather not. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> My apologies. Otherwise, I would. A brief brief it, question. Yes, thank you so much. Um, how does having any sort of major injuries in your life with joints, like I have a titanium joint in my body, like how does that impact aging and health moving forward? I, I don't think it should. Uh, titanium is, a, is an inert material. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that, um, of course, I mean, the trauma of the initial injury could have impacted you and could have slowed you down. And, but um you know, one of the good, but the titanium itself, I would not worry about its impact in terms of your health. I don't think there's any evidence that uh, it actually adversely affects your health. And some people are walking around with enormous amounts of titanium in their in their bodies. Um, one important news that I think I would like to share with you is that at least from the animal models, um, it's never too late to intervene in the aging process. And we see... Uh, even some of the drugs, for example, that we, we are testing, like rapamycin or metformin, um, can still have very significant effect in terms of the aging trajectory, even when administered late in life, the equivalent of a 65 to 70-year-old human. And, and I, I, around me, I have seen a number of cases of people really drastically changing their lifestyle at age 70 sometimes, 75, and really... Um, becoming reborn in, 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 into someone much more healthy. So uh, to me, that's an incredibly powerful news is that uh, the aging process is irreversible. We, we, can't, we cannot go back despite what you might have heard or read in the, in the, in the press. Uh, I don't think there's any clear evidence of true age reversal, but um, you can clearly uh, mitigate the effect of aging by adopting a healthy lifestyle at any age. Beautiful. Thank you. Lightning round. Very brief. Patty. Good morning and thank you so much for this excellent program. I'm very curious about supplements. There's so much controversy and I'd love to know what you take and what you recommend. Thank you very much. Love this question, but I'm going to disappoint you because I do not share uh, typically the supplement that I take. Um, 
But I, I'll tell you what are the guiding principles. I do take a, a significant number of supplements. So at the same time, I, I do believe in, in their potential. Um, supplements, the two things to, to, uh, to know about. One is it's an unregulated market. So you need to exert significant amount of circum circumspection in terms of what you buy and where you buy it from. Uh, there are a number of recognized vendors who, who sell clean supplements. That would be my number one concern. If you go on Amazon and just buy from anyone, um, you know, there's a supplement that I, I, I we've worked on here in my lab at the Buck called NMN. Uh, the recent study did, uh, they, they purchased NMN from 20 different vendors uh, on Amazon. And it turns out that I think three of them had the amount of NMN in, in, in the capsule that was actually, uh, uh, that, that they represented. Uh, five of them had no NMN in, in it. And the other one were characterized by all kinds of impurities of, of unknown nature. So just be wary of what you're buying and, and only buy supplements or from, from reputable vendors. And if you if you go to consumer reports, you will find you know they, they've listed who are the, the reputable vendors. That's number one. Number two, supplements are in different categories. Um, there are a number of supplements in, in the laboratory setting that have amazing effects. Uh, NMN, NR, uh, my lab has worked on those. We see, uh, we see remarkable effects. Ketone body esters, same thing. We work on those remarkable effects. Um, what defines something as a supplement versus as a drug is the fact that supplements do not have demonstrated efficacy. So when you are taking them, uh, you are essentially gambling. Uh, and you know, if you are a 20 year old uh, person who is in great shape, exercising, eating well, sleeping well, uh, I would argue you should not need any supplement. If you're 75 or 70 years old and you're starting to feel some of the effects of aging or you have chronic inflammation or, or, or other problems, I would argue, uh, why not try supplements and see what works? Uh, no, there are supplements that I think everyone should take. Uh, a multivitamin, uh, Centrum Silver, not to mention them. Uh, recent study shows that actually one Centrum Silver uh, a day actually decreases your risk of cognitive decline. Uh, cheap, safe, uh, any pharmacy available. Uh, you will never harm yourself by taking one Centrum Silver or you know, an equivalent multivitamin pill for, for the older individual. Second, um, omega fatty acids, uh, clear evidence that supplementation with omega fatty acids is uh, really uh, beneficial for most people. And, and many of us, unless you're eating a lot of fish, uh, fatty fish uh, do not have sufficient uh, omega fatty acid. In Japan, for example, uh, the Japanese population eats a lot more uh, fish, much higher levels of uh, uh, circulating omega fatty acids. And and uh, I, I, we do not know if it's directly correlated, but in general, a much longer living population. Um, then there's a whole series of vitamins for which we can become deficient as we age. I would say the two big ones for me are vitamin D and vitamin B12. And the easy thing there is to get them measured uh, and determine whether you actually you are uh, you have an appropriate level. Uh, it turns out close to 50% of the American population actually is deficient in vitamin D and vitamin B12, especially in the older individual. So easy thing to solve. So this would be the foundation. Then we go into things that are more experimental. Uh, I believe in NMN and NR, uh, frankly. Uh, those are really uh, interesting uh, supplements, at least in the laboratory setting. Uh, but again, those also can yield to some complications. If you're not followed by someone who really understands their biology and the side effects, uh, you might actually do yourself some harm. So I would argue, do this with a, your physician. And if your physician is not open to this type of uh, experimentation, find another physician. Uh, there, are, there are a number of them who are more progressive and more interested in this type of approach. And I think uh, that would be my, my way of going about this. I wish we could keep going, but it is, it is the top of the hour. And Eric, you have been so generous in your insight and your advice, and and I, I have uh, a renewed appreciation for the for the Buck Institute as a result of this. Thank you so so much. Our 
community loved this. It's very clear based upon the number of questions and you're seeing it in the chat right now. Um, just I'll be you. happy to come back whenever you want. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank Karen, you for having send me. it back to you. Wow, thank you so much, Eric and Chip. Wow, and thank all of you. That was a really incredibly busy hour of conversations and chat, and that is so much what we try to accomplish here in these interactive fireside chats. We will be sending you a recording it will be posted on our YouTube channel. It will also be posted on the Bucks website. So you'll have ability to access it uh, on both places. And um, thanks for coming. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you guys both for being here. It was a really fantastic talk. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, Chip and Carrie. Great, great to be with all of you. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.